we are going to get started with the last chapter in our unit on skeletal muscle. So what I'm going to do is I will go through the slides um, and then you have your information on connect that you're going to do. I think the good news is that most of the information that we talk about with the skeletal muscle um, is a lot of stuff that you've had in uh, both 110 and 220. But bottom line is we just want to take a look at the skeletal muscle, how it works, uh, muscle contractions. I've got the learning objectives on here with looking at primary roles, characteristics of muscle, with three different types of muscle fibers, a little bit about muscle cramps, um, muscle energy, uh, just kind of understanding the basics behind the muscle. I think the important thing is that when you think of a muscle cell, we're looking at a muscle fiber, and skeletal muscle is composed of several different types of tissue. When we think about the tissue, I, again, I want you to think about the muscle cells, we call them muscle fibers, same thing. And within there, we've got our nerve tissue, blood, various types of connective tissue, all of this stuff that works together. When you think about um, the nuclei, how many nuclei does a muscle have, a muscle cell have? So I want you to think about the fiber. A muscle fiber could be very long. It can go from the hip all the way down to the patella, to the knee. So it can be a very, very, very long fiber and within that fiber it is going to be multinucleated which is an important thing to think about the nucleus so multinucleated um, helps many many nuclei along the cell is there to help us with force production and muscle contraction and all the good things that happen so this is a nice overview of that photo right this is just displaying the relationship between the muscle and all the different types of connective tissue i would not ask you to memorize all of this anatomy again we spent some time last semester doing this but just know that each muscle is separated from each other and they're held into position by all of the connective tissue you know the connective tissue is your fascia and each separate layer of the connective tissue, right? The outermost is the epimyosin, and then inward we have the paramyosin um, surrounding those bundles. And then each of those bundles are the fascicle, we've got the endomyosin, I mean, all of these great things. Again, I just want you to focus on the fact that when we're looking at the fiber, all the way down to the small little myofibril and all of these smaller units, this just gives you the nice visual of what we're gonna be talking about. So when you think about a satellite cell, they're really important for growth and repair. So the satellite cells incorporated with into the fiber. So satellite cells are gonna be very predictive to play a role in how the muscle grows and repairs itself. So in response to resistance training, the satellite cells become very activated and they start dividing. As this happens, it increases the number of nuclei, as I mentioned earlier, right, multinuclear in the muscle fiber. So what's happening is you increase all of these small myonuclears in the muscle fiber. What happens is the ability for the fiber to synthesize the proteins increase. And what do we see? We see muscle growth. So really important to understand, you know, the more someone trains, the more nuclei they have. Um, we think about myonuclear, right? Myo is muscle, nucleus. So increasing the number of nuclei in the fiber, it's going to increase the volume, right? So the domain is a volume of cytoplasm surrounding each nuclei. And each of those little nuclei can support a um, limited amount of the domain. So it's going to maintain within part of each of those fibers. So again, more nuclei is going to allow for greater protein synthesis. Um, so this is where that hypothesis is. Let's say you are really strong and fit, and then as you age, you atrophy, you lose muscle. So there is a hypothesis or theory in, in the literature that states that you once were big and strong and you atrophied the muscle got smaller, you should still have a good amount of nuclei if you then later in life get back to lifting again, that your body should be able to repair that pretty quickly. That is kind of the, the theory behind satellite cells, how important they are and how they work. So when we take a look at just understanding the key structures, as I showed you, these all were, um, these are at the microscope level, but I showed you in that photo a couple slides earlier, I'm not gonna ask you all of this again, we're not gonna identify, we're not gonna do any anatomy and labeling of these parts, but really important to kind of understand how the muscle cell is broken down and where all that energy happens. So again, don't stress too much about what you're seeing here, but this is really just a nice overview of that photo to help us understand within that sacrolemma, and we've got the sacroplasm and the myofibrils. 
I really want us to understand the major part of the myofibrils is the myosin and actin. And that's what we're looking at right here on this screen, right? The, the actin and myosin and the arrangement of these proteins is really what gives the muscle and our skeletal muscle the striated appearance. So looking again at the actin and the myosin and how they form together, we call those uh, the tropomone at uh, the tropomyosin, um, the cross bridges that they form. This is a nice visual that shows you. I think the next photo is another nice view that um, shows us very similar kind of what's going on and what we're going to be talking about. So, you know, this microstructure view of a skeletal muscle fiber, right? This is, contains the myofibrils and all of the units. We call those the sacromeres, and this is where those cross bridges are formed right, the A band, the I band, what happens is that they form together, they connect and the, the Z line disappears. And what happens, you have a muscle contraction. So anyways, those are some visuals. But as you take a look, all of this action happens at the neuromuscular junction. So sending the electrical signal down from the motor cortex, down the spinal cord, that neuron, it needs to somehow communicate with the muscle cell itself. So all of this action, again, is at the neuromuscular junction. So re recall, we've spent some time down here. We spent a lot of time in 220 talking about this, that each skeletal muscle cell is connected to a nerve fiber and that branch coming from that small nerve cell. So these nerve cells, we know those are motor ne neurons. They um, extend from the spinal cord and that signal is gonna go down to the muscle fiber and it's gonna innervate the motor unit. So the stimulation is going to be initiating the process that we know as contraction. So the site of where all this activity happens is, again, the neuromuscular, um, neuromuscular junction, right? This is where the sacrum lemma forms this pocket. We call it the synaptic cleft. You've seen, we spent a lot of time looking at this last semester. So when a nerve impulse reaches the end of the motor nerve, this neurotransmitter, which you know here, is the acetylcholine is released and um, diffuses across the synaptic cleft to bind with the receptors on the motor end plate. This is what causes an increase. Um, it sends the signal for what we call depolarization down to the end plate potential. And it's large enough to really send the signal for the contraction, the contractile process to happen. So again, the neuron is gonna activate a particular cell within the muscle and that gap between the neuron and the muscle is where that message gets sent. The acetylcholine goes down there and that acetylcholine is what activates that action potential down all the way to the end plate. And then it just kind of goes through and we've got that contraction, which is you know, really critical to understand that neuromuscular junction. Here's the beautiful photo. We spent a lot of time Super critical for you to understand that that small little neuro jun neuromuscular junction, again, is where all of this is happening. So it's the connection point between the motor neuron, which I'm, there's plenty of great stuff here on the slide to look at, and the muscle fiber where they connect together is that neuromuscular junction. And again, the neurotransmitter that gets released to send that connection, the communication is acetylcholine, that's stored down in the synaptic vessels at the end of the nerve fiber. So this is again, just showing you a nice um, microscopic view. So without acetylcholine, the muscle, really we need it to communicate. So if we don't have, so either two kind of critical things, you either aren't gonna have the acetylcholine that's gonna to help to generate that communication for the muscle or the receptors. If the receptors aren't present, then it's not going to communicate to work. So again, it's just important things to understand that um, you know motor units are extending out of that spinal cord, innervating different, the, the individual muscle fibers and the site of where the motor neuron and cell meet. We know that as a junction, neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and this is what is communicating for the muscle to contract. And that's really the big thing you just want to remember. Again, I'm not going to spend time reading our take home messages. I think that you probably find them informative, but not worth me reading through what I just spoke about. So uh, this is a photo, the classic photo, you know, again, not spend, not worrying too much about how all of this happens again, but this is just the process of the relationship. Again, actin and myosin sites, uh, tropo, tropomone and tropomyosin, myosin cross bridges, and then calcium. So what's happening is these bridges are being formed. So when calcium binds the troponin and the tropomyosin is going to be re removed from those active sites on the 
acting prosperage. And this is when that attachment actually happens. So again, we, we, we have looked at this before. I, I, I want the big picture in this class. So here is power. Let's talk a little bit about power and how it works. So this illustration is corresponding to this, you know, the microscopic demonstration. I, what we see here is how in the first part, the top upper part, we've got an extended arm, right? So we got relaxed. We, we don't have contraction. So the top one, the top photos along the top of this slide is showing you relaxed sacromere. So what's happening here is the M line and um, the distance in what we know as the H band is there's lots of space, right? Lots of space. As you look at the bottom of this slide, now the contraction has happened, right? Look at the bicep muscle, it's contracted. Um, and how this has happened is the sacromere has changed. It's gotten shorter. So look at the Z disc moving closer together. When the sacromere moves closer, right? They've gotten closer together. Look at, again, the difference between the top and the bottom, it's contracted. So the um, M line, the H zone, all of those things have a, a changed. So I don't want to go too deep into exactly what's happening, but I want you to understand that the actin and myosin have now shortened. They've connected. It's fully contracted. It pulls those Z lines, Z lines, smaller and smaller. So this is the visual for what's happening at the muscle, you know, visual for you what's happening at the muscle. So the power that we can generate, let's say the bicep that you see here in this photo, the power is going to depend on the length of the muscle itself. Right? That's kind of a really important piece to understand. So this is the visual. So what you want to think about is the energy for the muscle contraction is going to come from the breakdown of ATP. And that breakdown happens by the, by the enzyme called myosin ATPase. That enzyme is located at the head of the myosin cross bridge. So again, kind of that bioenergetic pathway we've already talked about is responsible for the synthesis of ATP. So the breakdown of ATP breaks down to ADP with an inorganic phosphate, that's that PI, inorganic phosphate, and the release of energy serves to energize the myosin cross bridges. So what happens when those get energized, it in turn, it's going to pull the actin molecules over the myosin and it shortens the muscle, which is what you saw in the photo that I just showed you. So we have different ways that ATP can be provided to the muscle. We've already learned that. We did that in metabolism, all the different ways that, um, you know, that we can go through the phosphocreatine, glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation. All of that great stuff now comes together as we look here at the muscle. This is a photo I really like this because again, it pulls together things that we've just previously recently spoken about. Um, and so I really think this is a, a nice slide. So it shows the three sources of, that's my dog shaking in the background. It shows the three sources of ATP production in the muscle during contraction, right? The phosphocreatin, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. So at the muscle, so what, what, what are you looking at here is you've got the actual muscle fiber, what's happening in the muscle fiber, and then you've got the blood, right? So it's kind of the blood is where the nutrients come from. The blood is going to go through the capillaries, capillaries send it into the muscle fiber. And so at the muscle fiber le level, we're looking at the blood that's circulating and releasing the nutrients for fuel. The fuel enters the muscle fiber and it happens through capillaries. They're just not pictured on this slide. Um, so the big picture here is showing you that we're providing fuel through the blood to the cells. We need ATP, right over here in the purple, look over here all the way on the, the right side, purple over there on the right, the ATP is gonna be broken down so work can happen. And then to help reestablish re -establish ATP levels, we've got um, you know metabolism that's happening in the middle. So if you look at the differences, the two things I want you to look at over on the right side, we've got the myosin ATPase and um, the, the calcium. So with muscle biology, we've got fast twitch muscles. That's going to break down very, very quickly, right? And then we've got that ATPase. So really important to, to kind of understand how all this comes together, how the energy, uh, the metabolism is happening. Again, this provides a nice big photo of the pathway that's a helping produce the uh, energy, the fuel for the muscle to contract. Again, this is a um, 
you know, another nice image right from our material that I, I think is beneficial. If things like this confuse you, then don't worry too much. You know, I'm not going to ask you to do any labeling, but what's happening here is it's just showing you how the muscle gets excited, what leads to the muscle contraction. So, um, you know, it's illustrating, we go through some excitement happens through all of these steps and all of these steps that we spent so much time in 220 talking about leads to the muscle contraction itself. What I want you to know is that these act, it's really the act in a mouse. And so another photo that gives us another zoom on here is that same, right? The molecular steps that leads to a muscle contraction, right? So the rusting muscle, then we have relaxation, then the cross bridges get formed, and then the power stroke happens. And that power stroke is really what pulls the actin towards each other and we result in shortening and that shortening as you and I know as a contraction and through this the AT, ADP is going to be released and then it goes through and now we get a new molecule the ATP that's going to happen and just kind of this cycle so this might be too much this visual but this is just that process we spent a lot of time looking at so I think it's important, again, I spent a lot of time telling you that I want this class to be the big picture. I want you to be in the world of exercise and understand how we take these cellular science and put it into the big picture. And I think one big thing we spent a lot of time, or I want you to spend a lot of time thinking about is muscle fatigue, right? It's a real thing, right? So high intensity exercise or prolonged submaximal exercise can eventually result in decline in the muscle's ability to continue generating power, right? We only have so much energy. So this decrease in muscle power, we call it fatigue. So specifically the muscle fatigue, right, is defined as a reduction in muscle power and output that is a result in both the muscle force generation and shortening velocity, right? Some important stuff. On, on here. So we've got the definition here. I've got, you know, the two big things that are going to lead to, um, you know, depending on the type of exercise and environmental conditions, fatigue can result in different types of imbalances. So we can have nervous, central nervous system or peripheral factors within the skeletal muscle. So we call that the central nervous system fatigue. We talked about that, uh, I think, a couple chapters ago. Um, so although we don't know the exact cause of muscle fatigue, I really want you to understand it's a decrease in force production, a decrease in velocity, some important stuff um, to really look at. When we're doing high intense exercise that's anaerobic, it's very difficult to continue generating ATP. When you're looking at a more aerobic, we're depleting the um, glycogen system and we've got to replenish usually electrolytes. You can also have things like free radicals that can get um, in the way, making it difficult for actin mass and to kind of do their thing. But, you know, bottom line is what is causing the fatigue? And, um, you know, that's something I, we want to look at. So it's high intensity, it's going to deplete much quicker than the longer intensity, right? Really difficult in the high intensity that anaerobic system can continue uh, generating the energy. So here with muscle force, this is kind of that visual. So um, here, this picture is showing you fatigue during exercise and muscle fatigue differs from injury, right? Injury is different. Um, then muscle, so muscle fatigue is reversible, usually a little bit of rest, it could be a couple hours, um, whereas recovery from damage can take days, weeks, all that stuff. So bottom line is that with fatigue, we are going to lose uh, force production, right? So again, different from, you know, a basic injury. So here is the four categories of different types of exercise that uh, can happen. So it's widely agreed that we have, again, these four big domains of exercise intensity. So the different exercise intensity categories, moderate, heavy, very heavy, severe exercise. Again, this table is showing you that kind of summary of the characteristics of percentage of maximal heart rate of VO2 max with each exercise. So if you understand this, I think you can read this and understand that you can envision different sports, um, different types of activities that would call upon uh, the different intensity of exercise itself. So big thing is, you know, we want to look at is after we look at these four different types of fatigue that can happen in various intensities, during high intensity exercise, short duration, it really is going to cause muscle fatigue. Again, that can be caused by different issues, multifactorial, we just talked about that, right, decreased calcium release, 
um, can happen, accumulation of metabolites that inhibit, right, the sensitivity to calcium. Um, all of these different things can happen. So when you think about what is a muscle spasm, right, the muscle spasm itself is just that involuntary shortening. So quivering, what's happening is this, the central nervous system is being triggered with all of this, these messages and the muscle doesn't know, should it be lengthening? Should it be shortening? So this quivering, this spasm ends up happening. You see this a lot with high intensity exercise um, and there's a lot of different kind of quacky solutions to this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but really quite frankly, you know, the most um, beneficial is usually stretching. I mean, that's usually it's gonna be caused again by high, um, high energy, but the best thing to do is going to be, as you see, kind of lengthening the Golgi tendon organs and letting some stretching happen. But when you think about muscle fatigue, right, and all of the different things that can happen, the key metabolites that contribute to muscle fatigue is going to be an increase in phosphate ions, hydrogen ions, free radicals, right, increases in each of these metabolites results in myofilament sensitivity to calcium and a reduction in force production, right? So kind of really looking and understanding that at this kind of biochemical level, the, this change happens in the muscle and then our body signals that as simply fatigue, right? So the underlying increase in sensitivity changes. So studies indicate that increased potassium results in decrease in muscle force production because the hydrogen binds to the calcium binding sites and that prevents the troponin from initiating a contra contraction. So my, this is way too cellular, but I want you to understand that as to when someone says, I'm tired, my muscles want to stop, really what's happening to that fatigue during heavy exercises and, you know, that biochemical release that's happening with these byproducts, right? Primarily hydrogen, um, the phosphate, the calcium that's being released and really promoting muscle fatigue during high intense exercise. And this is a diagram right out of, um, you know, an article that's not too old to try to help give us that paper. I'm going to be very frank and tell you people are still trying to understand this whole system. It's still being researched. So muscle activation with spasms and uncontrolled muscle contractions that happens involuntarily. Why this happens, the best mode around uh, dealing with this, all of these things. There's many different factors that promote muscle fatigue. Um, and it's really, again, it's still being investigated, right? So we call, you know, we, we know this exists, you have felt it yourself. Um, what do we do? How do we help with these uncontrolled contractions? Some, some used to say electrolyte, you know, like giving people electrolytes. And we know that that's not going to answer. Stretching can be very helpful. But really popular theory is that sometimes you can have, you know, just cramps right, by dehydration, but we really want to understand the muscle fatigue, what triggers it and how we best control it. And I don't have an answer for you on that. one. But we think about muscle cramps, I do want to share with you a little bit of, so a little bit of information on if you've heard a little bit about people ingesting kind of spices, et cetera, stuff like that. So what we know, and this might sound, some of you might be like, what in the heck is she talking about? But um, scientists have understood that there's a strong relationship between the mouth, right? I said the mouth and what goes in the mouth and um, sending message to the brain. So think about if you've ever had cold ice cream, right? You know, there's a, a true thing called brain freeze, right? We have all experienced kind of that pain associated with drinking an icy cold ice cream or drink and it's brain freeze and that brain freeze sensation occurs due to the rapid cooling of all of these nerves on the roof of our mouth. So that same philosophy goes into muscle cramps. So what's happened is that researchers have predicted to inhibit motor neuron from firing, we could maybe, we can actually do this, um, inhibit the motor neuron from firing if we ingest some natural ingredients that are going to stimulate the sensory nerves located in the mouth and the throat. So these, um, so again, looking at, we understand that muscle cramps appear to be triggered by neural mechanism in the central nervous system, and that's promoting excessive firing. So to inhibit this, 
they believe this mouth to brain connection of um, is this whole ingesting of some natural um, spices. So why? Again, because receptors in the mouth are obviously reporting to the brain and that's, you know, kind of this new research that's going on. But really bottom line, when we think about muscle cramps and people that are prone to muscle cramps, um, you know, it can be people that are well hydrated, not well hydrated. They've done a lot of studies on this. Um, you know, could it be electrolyte imbalance? Could it be dehydration? You know, extreme exercise conditions, prolonged, hot, any of these things can end up um, being related to it. But, you know, again, I just want to let you know that um, there's limited evidence supporting the notion of dehydration electrolyte imbalances. They really thought that was the, the fact, but that's kind of, they realize that it's not the end all of what's the evidence is associating it with, but muscle cramps, um, occur to exercise induced changes in the central nervous system. And that central nervous system is changing the excitability of those motor, motor neurons. So if the motor neurons innervating the skeletal muscle becomes super hyper excited and they undergo repeated depolarization, this results in that what we know is those cramps or muscle spasms and voluntary muscle contractions and the potential for an increased motor neuron excitability, high levels of excitability is um, the you have lack control of your muscles. And that's kind of what the science and what the researchers are still, still trying to understand. But again, the, we wanna now move over into different types of muscle fibers, right? So we have these different types of muscle fibers and that is, you know, you know this, you've um, kind of understand muscle fibers, but we have these biochemical properties that change within them. So the three primary bio, um, mechan biochemical characteristics of muscle is the oxidative capacity of the muscle, right? Capillaries, mitochondria. We've got the type of myosin, right? So what type of myosin, what speed is it? Uh, what is it being, you know, what is it going to be used for, right? This, so when you're looking at the um, my, uh, myosins, we're looking in humans, right? That we've got um, the speed of how fast we break down ATPs, right? Muscle fibers that contain ATPase is going to degrade ATP really rapidly. And then the third one is the abundance of contractile proteins within the fiber itself. How many contractile proteins, right? So that's going to influence um, the active contractile proteins you guys know as actin and myosin in the muscle fiber. So large fibers contain large amounts of actin and myosin are going to generate more force than the fibers with lower levels of these key contractile proteins. So that's kind of just your basics. You understand this, it's kind of in a slide form for you to see that. Um, but let me just make sure I got all the stuff on that slide. So when you think about that ATPase, guys, remember that's important for how quickly our ATP is broken down. This is gonna happen faster in fast twitch in comparison to slow twitch, slow twitch, um, are a very efficient slow twitch, but they're not as efficient at quickly providing those contractions. So a power for pure power, we really need our fast twitch muscle fibers, right? And the fast twitch muscle fibers is where we find that ATPase, and that is what's needed to produce more protein. So when you think about someone who has a lot of hypertrophy, right, in large muscles, this is what's leading to larger cross-sectional area of those muscles, right, bigger size, because they have more myofibrils available. We have more myofibrils, we're gonna have more contractile proteins where you're gonna find that ATPase to break down. Okay, so as we look here at the muscle level, right, we are looking at fast twitch. We know fa tw fast twitch muscles have a larger cross-sectional area. So in comparison, in comparing the contractile proteins of the muscle fiber, right, the characteristics, we've got four, four big ones. Number one is maximal force production, right, labeled by the force production there. Uh, the second is speed of contraction. So speed of contraction, that's at Vmax, so cross-sectional area. So the shorter the contraction, the faster the force we're going to have. That's all regulated by that ATPase activity. And the third is maximal power output. So again, high force is going to give us stronger contractions. And the fourth is the efficiency of the contraction, right? How efficient is it? So um, that efficiency is the muscle fiber is going to be measuring that really the economy of the muscle. So an efficient fiber would require less energy to perform a certain amount of work compared to a less efficient 
right? So um, how much ATP is going to be used. Um, the contractile protein property, right? That maximal power output, the power of a muscle, again, is going to be determined by both the force generated, how much force multiplied by the shortening velocity, right? So the maximum power output of a muscle fiber is defined as the product of the force generated multiplied by the shortening, right? So muscle fibers with high force generating capacity and a fast shortening velocity are going to produce high power. This is very, very different than muscle fibers that possess much more slow shortening velocities or low force generating. So kind of, again, that difference, fast twitch are going to be more powerful. However, they're less efficient. Why are they less efficient? Because of how much fuel they're, and that's what leads to this fatigue, right? So what's fatigue resistant, muscle fiber efficiency, the difference is what we call between slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers. Right, so um, when we take a look, let's go to the next slide. How do we know any of these things? I mean, this is not an important slide, but just to let you know, how do we know any of these things we're talking about, Dan, because we can't see this, is um, it all happens down because of a, a biopsy, right? A muscle biopsy is going to remove a little bit of tissue under a microscope. The muscle biopsy is going to tell us all these great things, right? Technique um, used to kind of identify the different myosin, the protein properties that help us to identify is it a type one, a um, type 2A or, or, or 2X, different types of the muscles like the fast twitch versus the, the slow twitch. I'm not gonna go really into the second two, the immunohistical um, hist uh, histochemical staining or the gel electrophoresis, but they're just techniques at the microscopic level that help us to understand. So here the biopsy and staining determines the actual, what we're looking at here is the protein that's available and that helps us to identify that staining helps us to identify the red staining, um, this different types of muscle, right? The blue cells of the type one, the green cells of the type two A, and then the cells that look really dark in color, we call those, those the two X, really high force production and high energy, um, but they use up the energy really quick. So again, you've seen this, you've seen these written in, in 110, 220, uh, the different types. I do just want to make sure you know that when you take a look at type 2X, many books, older books may have the word type 2B. I myself commonly, well, I'm so used to saying type 2B, but you know this as type 2X. So it's, again, type 1, those are slow oxidative, contain large numbers of oxidative enzymes, refined all our mitochondria volume, surrounded by lots of capillaries, and um, then we have uh, obviously the type one, right? Lots of myoglobin, high capillaries, long aerobic events. When we take a look at um, the fast twitch fibers, with their what we call the type two, right? They are going to have relatively small number of mitochondria and a really limited capacity for aerobic metabolism. So they, they have less resistance to fatigue um, than the slow twitch. However, the good news is that they're really rich in glycolytic enzymes. So what happens is they really give us this huge amount of anaerobic capacity. So the specific force that we're going to get uh, per cross-sectional area, obviously we're going to get the most force out of those type two fibers. Um, it's kind of similar to the 2A actually, but it, it, both type 2A and, and 2X are going to give us a lot more power than what we get from those type 1. So the type 2X gives us a lot of force output. However, the efficiency, because of the high mass and ATPs activity, requires so much fuel. The result is a greater energy expenditure per unit of work. So really trying to appreciate that regular training can modify both type two and type one biomechanical and contractile pro pro properties. So hear me out. We have both types of fibers. We can train both types of fibers, right? We can train both the biochemical components and the contractile properties of human fibers. And we also have the ability to convert fast fibers into slow fibers. So that's kind of a, an important kind of pause on, on kind of understanding these. This is another nice um, view of kind of this table that's showing you, um, you know, the different types, right? The biomechanical, 
biomechanical, the biochemical and contractile properties, the characteristics that are different in the different muscle fiber types. So, you know, some of you like tables, some of, some of you don't like to look at tables. It depends on what kind of visual learner you are, but pretty much understanding, I think at this point you understand the differences, right? Like tension, velocity, endurance, this next photo I think is really nice. It really brings everything together, right? And these are just added figures to try to help really hit home the big picture of muscles, right? How the muscle contracts and the different types of muscle contraction. We have numerous studies have investigated that muscle fiber types and the makeup here in our human muscles, lots of um, interesting facts have happened. We know that there's no sex differences in fiber distribution. We know that the average sedentary man or woman possesses about 50% of our slow twitch fibers. We also know that really successful power athletes, such as sprinters, have a really large percent of fast twitch, whereas somebody who's an endurance athlete has a high percent of slow twitch. Those are all the things we know, right? So those kind of important things. So what you notice here is that high efficiency versus low endurance, right? So what's going to be higher efficiency? What's going to be lower? Um, we can also look at the color difference between red versus white. Um, I think I've already said this analogy. You can take a look at a turkey. There's white meat and dark meat. And that's the same thinking, right? So you sit down at Thanksgiving and you're having dark meat or white meat. What's happening is are you eating your type one fiber? Is it the type two fiber, right? The slow twitch versus the fast twitch. So I like this photo just because it pulls in the different, right? Metabolism, we talked so much about that already. Endurance, um, shortening velocity, efficiency. And this has nothing really new, this slide. This is just giving you the variation in percentage of various types of fibers that exist, right? Showing you the differences, um, uh, between the, the three different types of muscle fibers. So again, examples of slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers in a table form. This is again, a nice visual comparing short, uh, maximal shortening velocities between the fiber types. I think you kind of get the differences, right? The, the how much stronger that 2X is going to be, right, in that comparison. Okay, so um, trying to think of, you know, again, looking at those, at, at the differences between uh, fiber types and how much force and power we can generate. And you understand it all comes down to the energy that's available. When we take a look at um, power athletes, right? So sprinters are going to obviously have more percentage of fast twitch uh, fibers, lower percentage of fur. Um, in contrast, you know, endurance athletes, marathoners are going to have high percentage of slow twitch fibers and low percentage of fast twitch. So again, the muscle fibers are really known to play a role in performance. Eh, you've heard this before. So considerable variation is going to exist between really successful athletes that can that compete in the same sport themselves. We want to realize that as well. Um, so you know, this is showing us the, the differences in um, two equally successful sprinters can really show different percentage of, of fiber division. It's not all going to be the same. One runner might possess 70% slow twitch fibers and a very similar speed could have 85%. So there's variation um, even, you know, within the same athletic event. Kind of moving along here. So we talked about how they contract. Now we want to take a look at what types of movement happens. So the act, the types of action, right? So when we talk about the action, we're looking at how the muscle itself moves, the process of the skeletal muscle to uh, muscle force generation, right? How force generation is what we know as muscle contraction. So to cause this contraction, the muscle is going to have to lengthen and shorten. So these actions have names, right? So the term muscle action is how we talk about forces developed. When force is developed, muscle action happens. So muscle action, we know this is muscle contraction, both lengthening and shortening. So we have lots of different types of actions um, that, that obviously can happen. Right. So let's say you're going to do a dumbbell a curl, right? You're going to bicep curl. So you can't move the weight unless you've got some tension that's going to happen in the dumbbell and it's going to move. So we call an isometric 
uh, contraction is referred to as static exercise. So no move, isometric actions. That's common like with holding up in a, you know, your posture, uh, maintaining a static position, standing, sitting, et cetera. In contrast to isometric is where we have movement, right? So this is going to be called dynamic exercise, isotonic dynamic exercise that's going to have either concentric or eccentric, right? So a concentric is shortening and eccentric is going to be lengthening. Again, I'm thinking you've heard these terms before, right? So concentric versus eccentric. So this is the photo that shows you exactly that, right? So that differences of a muscle is given a stimulus, a brief electrical kind of shock sends this nerve impulse innervating, and then we end up having a contraction. So the muscle is going to first shorten, oops, sorry about that. The muscle is going to shorten and then, right? So the shortening and then the lengthening. So concentric, eccentric, isometric, right? So we, we I think you've seen that photo, you understand some of those basics behind that. So if a muscle is given again a stimulus, such as a brief little shock is going to be applied, we can get this twitch, but the muscle responds with a simple twitch. And that is recorded on the electrical cord recording device. We can look at that in the lab. Um, it can be studied for contraction and relaxation. So it's kind of, I've got some photos that illustrate in the next few slides that are illustrating a simple twitch, right? Is I, um, you know, let's a frog muscle. I remember doing frog muscles in school and I think high school biology, we spent time doing this. You can notice that the twitch is divided into different phases. They last a little bit of different time. And um, that is right, what we simply can re record, um, uh, uh, you know, on, on a machine. So let's take a look, let me just show you. So here is, again, the recording of a simple twitch. It's got, you know, time periods of kind of that latent period, the actual contraction, and then the relaxation that happens. All of this is pretty simple um, to do in a lab situation and see this happening. So as stated, um, you know, as we've talked about, right, how much force can we generate in a single muscle fiber is really related, bottom line, to how much myosin cross bridges are happening, right? The actin and myosin, how much is available. So the amount of force during a muscle contraction is really going to depend on four big things. Number one is the number of motor units that we're recruiting, right? How many do we have? Right, so number of motor units, we talked about that a couple chapters ago. If we only have a few motor units or recruit, it's gonna be small. However, if we got lots of motor units, it's gonna be a bigger contraction, right? So that's an important one. The second is the length of the muscle. So a factor that's gonna determine force is gonna be the initial length. So the muscle's ability to generate force is gonna, what optimal length is really what we're going to be looking at. So the resting length is longer than optimal. The overlap of actin and myosin is going to be really limited, much less. So kind of an important thing to understand is that, um, you know, again, that, that size. The third one is the factor that affects the amount of force a muscle exerts upon contraction, right? So that neural stimulation. So simple muscle twitches that have been studied reveal that there's some fundamental properties um, that are going to help with sustained contractions. So that is the third. And then um, the fourth one is our muscle contractions occur in with basic body movement are pretty much going to be, I'm sorry, our final is going to be how much force we produce, the force production. The impact of muscle force is can be, you know, different ways. One is if a muscle performs about a fatiguing exercise, so really prolonged high intensity, then the subsequent force production is gonna be decreased, right? So obviously understanding that factor that's contributing to fatigue and that is um, you know, gonna fatiguing exercise uh, is an important thing. So warm up and results in what we call post-activation potential. We won't get too deep in, any more into that, but that's really kind of bottom line, what it's what it's called. This photo here is showing you simply the recording changing from a simple twitch to what we call summation when everything comes together and then tetanus when it peaks, um, is showing you kind of those simple twitches and then increasing in frequency as you see along that X axis results in um, kind of that, that full contraction. This is all right at the muscle level, right? So what's happening um, at that muscle level, this is another photo showing you the, the length, uh, the impact of neural stimuli that, that can um, 
help generate that increasing level to get us to that maximum, the relationship between increasing the stimulus of strength and how forceful the contraction. If it's a weak stimuli, you're not going to activate very many motor units, right? So that I can produce big force. If it's increasing in stimulus, the strength is recruiting more and more and more of these motor units, and it's going to produce higher force production. So just the visual for what you understand. And this is the kind of the very classic photo. I think it's in every physiology book ever. This is that length tension relationship in the skeletal muscle, right? The optimal length for a muscle to exist shown here in this photo um, will produce maximal force when stimulated. So the length that are above here, right, looking at the difference between number two and number three is showing you that optimal length for us to understand the sacromere is going to change and, and you're going to have a contraction and this is where the force is being produced, right? So I'm, I'm not too sure what else to share because we've noted a lot of this previously. Again, you're looking at um, if cross bridges can't happen, then you're not going to have tension, right? So at the other extreme, when the muscle shortened about 60% of its resting length, the, those Z lines get very close to the thick myosin filaments and then shortening more shortening can really end up happening. And then in the third photo, kind of showing you how that happens. So understanding that basic muscle contraction, force velocity relationship, the different types of muscle tissue, right? So type one and the two subdivisions of type two. I think it's also imperative to always note that what happens as we age, both old age and disease can have a negative influence on the ability of skeletal muscle to exert force, right? We know this and you know this as sarcopenia, right? So with aging, as we lose muscle mass with aging, age related decline, it usually begins around the age of 25, be careful, and occurs throughout life. So this rate, how fast we lose, uh, usually it's a very slow phase of muscle loss, right? So between the ages of 25 to 50, it's kind of slow, but then after 50, it really increases from 50 to 80, like 40% mass loss. And by the time someone's 80, but they're about one half the total skeletal muscle mass. So aging re results in lots of loss of fast twitch. Usually it's type 2X that we're losing and an increase in slow twitch fibers. So from a clinical perspective, age-related sarcopenia really we know has a negative effect because it increases risk for falls, um, balance, inability to live on their own, daily independence. So this is something we're always looking at, right? So that aging, active aging, how do we keep people actively living to be healthy? And then diabetes, I like to talk about a lot of diabetes in this class. So the incident of type two diabetes, we know is rapidly increasing. Uncontrolled diabetes is, happens with a lot of progressive muscle mass. Uncontrolled diabetes and aging accelerates aging and muscle mass. Both aerobic and resistance exercise have been shown, we know the answer, to be very protective against um, uh, you know, against diabetes, right? So, you, well, no, I keep saying the same thing. Cancer, about 50% of our cancer patients suffer from a rapid loss of skeletal muscle mass. So we call this in the world of exercise and cancer, Katachia, a word you may not have heard of, but um, there's a lot of students that will land jobs working in cancer rehabs with cancer patients. So cancer mediated loss of skeletal muscle, um, meaning that it's the chemicals and it's a treatment of, of cancer that leads to how much muscle wasting we have. So we know that um, because of this, we are looking at lots of ways to try to counteract cancer-induced catastrophes. Counter, um, so we know that exercise is very therapeutic for cancer patients um, and trying to figure out how to work about trying to minimize how much muscle loss. And the muscle dystrophy is just a, it's an, um, heredity muscle disease that weakens the skeletal muscles. So the diseases are characterized by defects in the muscle proteins, progressive weakness. There's lots of different types of muscle dystrophy that exists. A very common form is one that you get, people get diagnosed in childhood one, but you also can have muscle dystrophy that varies. Um, it's some that people have normal life and then later on it can set in, but really looking at muscle dystrophy, um, lots of studies are still going into how, um, how this can be changed. So what we went over today is um, chapter eight. Again, the big picture, not the small stuff, skip the small stuff, know the big photos that I've uh, been focusing on.